Thank you for attending the Prospects for Federal Paid Leave Mandates under the Biden Administration, a webinar series on guidance on state and local paid sick and family leave laws. At this time, all participants are on mute. If you would like to leave a question for the panelists, please do so in the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. They will answer as many questions as possible, but may get back to you after the event is over. On the next slide, you will see a legal disclaimer. If you are interested in CLE credit for this presentation, a email will be sent to all registrants tomorrow, allowing instructions for how to obtain such credit. At this time, I will turn it over to our first presenter, Joshua Seidman. Josh. Uh, great. Uh, thanks so much, uh, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We are so excited for you to be here. Um, I'm joined uh, today by my uh, wonderful colleagues, Tracy Billows and Stan Hill. Um, we have a ton of great information uh, to discuss with you as, as this next segment of our joint paid sick leave and paid family leave webinar series kicks off. I'm going to turn it over to Tracy to walk us through uh, the agenda and get us going uh, with the first segment on the, uh, on the FMLA. Thank you so much, Josh. I appreciate it. If we could go to the next slide so we can show everyone the agenda for today's program. Um, we are so excited to be here with you talking about our um, updates on the Family Medical Leave Act and paid leave. Both Stan and Josh are two of our preeminent experts, so you are in for a great treat today in terms of their expertise, knowledge, tracking of these issues, et cetera. I can still remember Josh coming to me many years ago saying, Tracy, this paid sick leave thing's going to take off. Good thing I listened to him because he was so right. Um, and Stan has been a partner for me throughout everything with Families First as I'm trying to understand the 12,000 FAQs that came out from the DOL and what do they mean, Stan, and why are they changing? And oh my goodness. So you're in for a tremendous treat with the two of them. You know, many of you uh, may have seen me present before. I know leaves and accommodations are near and dear to my heart. So I'm thrilled to be co-presenting with them today. What we thought we would do, next slide please, is just sort of give you a quick overview of the FMLA. And you may be saying, Tracy, we've heard you say this a million times before. Well, the issue is really understanding how this is all going to interplay with all these different proposed laws that are out there right now, because it's really going to have an impact on the unpaid FMLA one way or another, whether it's we're going to be running more time concurrent with the FMLA, and substituting of pay time, or we're just gonna modify the FMLA, who knows? We got lots to share with you in terms of what could be the future. So next slide, just quickly. Um, remember the FMLA is an unpaid leave statute. It provides up to 12 weeks of job protected leave for specific family and medical reasons. And then of course, don't forget about the 26 weeks for military caregiver. It currently only applies to employers with 50 or more employees, as many of you saw with Families First, right? We had lots of different changes there. Um, also, the FMLA only applies to employees who have worked for an organization for 12 months and 1,250 hours in the past 12 months, and where they have at least 50 employees within a 75 mile radius. Next slide. Um, you know, we give you these sort of things because many of the proposals you're going to hear us talk about today are broader, either in terms of eligibility, pay, et cetera. Uh, some qualifying reasons for under the FMLA uh, for all of you, you know, birth and bonding. So childbirth, bonding with the child. Um, if an employee has their own serious health condition, which is all of you know, has a very specific definition that we include below. Employees uh, caring for family members with a serious health condition. And then, of course, qualifying military exigency. What I like to call this is non medical military bonding time, right? This is bonding with someone who is being called or deployed into duty. Um, and this is taking care of personal affairs or legal affairs or short term bonding, military um, events, et cetera. Next slide, please. In terms of family and medical leave, I know this is a little bit small, but don't worry, we'll send out the slides after this, but you can see that you know we rank last in terms of government mandated paid leave for new parents. 
And I think that's why you are starting to see so many of these laws come about. Uh, I know many of you are already dealing with state and local ordinances that provide either paid family leave, paid parental leave, et cetera. Um, but you know, really, I think we are on the cusp of having some sort of federal solution finally push through, which one, uh, I'll let Stan and Josh debate which one, since we're all gonna be presenting on different ones today. But I do think we are finally at the point here in the US where we will likely see something, whether it's only paid sick leave, whether it's paid family leave, whether it's a combo of both, stay tuned. Uh, but with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Josh to walk us through some of the state and local paid leave patchworks that we're currently seeing to help you understand how this better solution is going to ultimately impact that. Josh, over to you. Great, thank you, Tracy. Hi again, everyone. Um, so as Tracy said, you know, in order to get a feel for the federal landscape and, and the need for a federal paid leave solution from the employer perspective, it's good to take a few minutes to understand what the current patchwork of paid leave, both in terms of sick leave and family leave uh, looks like and why it's creating challenges for multi-state and nationwide employers. Uh, so as you'll see on the next slide, we're gonna get started with uh, the paid sick leave landscape. And then from there, we'll, we'll talk about paid family leave. So this slide, if you've seen uh, some of our earlier segments of our paid sick leave webinar series, you've probably seen this slide. Um, it has evolved over the course of this webinar series. Uh, the number of total mandates in the country near the end of last year in December uh, was nearly 70 total paid sick leave and PTO mandates. Uh, in early 2021, that number dropped down into the low 60s. Today, it's over 70. Uh, that gives you just a little flavor for what's happening in the paid sick leave world. The landscape is constantly changing underneath businesses' feet, right? It, it is, there are new laws that are being enacted, some that are going to affect immediately, largely in this COVID-19 emergency supplemental paid sick leave or public health emergency space. New vaccine leave mandates have been popping up in select locations over the last few months. Uh, and on top of that, we have some of the, the older, and I say older, just you know, maybe a year or so, of these COVID-19 vaccine or COVID-19 uh, non-vaccine, but other emergency leave laws that are starting to sunset. Some that sunset at the end of last year, but then were reenacted in 2021. And all of that is on top of the general non-COVID-19 paid sick leave and PTO last year that employers have had to deal with for a number of years. Um, if you take a look at this slide, you'll see that total mandates column. Again, it talks about uh, you know, somewhere in the mid to high 60s, low 70s in terms of total laws. But then you look at the other columns and you will see that the, the math doesn't quite add up. And the reason for that is that a number of locations have multiple paid sick leave laws that are currently in effect. California, New York, uh, most recently uh, Massachusetts and Maryland, both of which just passed uh, COVID-19 or, or public health emergency paid leave mandates in the last couple of weeks. Um, those locations have both general and COVID-specific paid leave laws. Uh, in addition, so, so you sort of count all of those up and that gets us to this headcount of, of total laws that is more than just the number of jurisdictions that are seen on this slide. Um, some of the locations, their laws are tied up in litigation. That impacts the, the three laws that are uh, in Texas, Austin, San Antonio, and Dallas. That's why they're called out in red. None are currently in effect. None are likely to go into effect. Um, Sacramento City and Sacramento County also in red because those locations are most likely, you know, those locations have seen their laws sunset over the last handful of weeks. Um, and a number of these other locations will likely be seeing their locations and their laws sunset shortly as states and localities end their declarations of disaster or other states of emergency um, based on the, the declining numbers of COVID-19. A uh, couple of other final just thoughts on this slide. Um, number one, the federal uh, two laws that are mentioned here, we'll be diving into those in just a couple of minutes, so stay tuned for that. Um, at the state level, the two newest laws, uh, the New Mexico mandate, which doesn't go into effect, uh, that's a general non-COVID mandate, doesn't go into effect until July of 2022. And then in Virginia, there is a statewide law that was passed, but only impacts certain home health care workers. And that one will be starting up in just a few weeks on July 1st of this year. Um, so with that, uh, we'll take a look at the next slide. Uh, again, this is just uh, another representation of the paid sick leave uh, landscape and the patchwork impacting multi-state and nationwide employers. 
Uh, this is an interactive map that CIFAR prepared and rolled out in January of this year. Um, really great resource. It, it breaks down the sick leave landscape and evolution of paid sick leave into six distinct time periods to show you what the geographical and substantive scope of those laws look like within each of those time periods. Uh, the resource also has some really neat uh, footnotes and information corresponding to each of those, those time periods. Totally worth a few minutes of your time if you haven't taken a look at it already. Um, amazingly enough, although really not that surprising, given what I just said about the, the, the state of flux that paid sick leave is in right now, um, this, this resource is a bit outdated. There are the new laws in Virginia and New Mexico that I mentioned, the new COVID-19 laws in Massachusetts and, and, and public health emergency leave law in Maryland, the spread of the vaccine paid leave laws, um, to name a few that are not reflected in this graphic just from mid-January of this year. Uh, as you see on the next slide, we also have paid family leave. Now, it is not a, as robust of a patchwork as the paid sick leave world, but still certainly worth paying attention to and giving similar challenges, both practical and legal challenges, for employers that have operations in multiple of these states. There are 11 total uh, paid family leave laws around the country. You can see nine states plus Washington, D.C., as well as uh, the municipal law, the paid parental leave ordinance in San Francisco. Um, the first four of those state laws, California, New Jersey, Rhode Island, and New York, can be thought of as paid family leave laws in the sense of they provide you know, paid time off, whether it's wage, wage replacement benefits or leave entitlement, that depends on the law, but they will provide at least wage replacement for employees who need to be out for bonding with a new child, care of a family member with a serious health condition. Um, usually the definition of family member is, is broader than the scope of a, a family member under the federal FMLA. But what these four laws don't cover are employee absences for their own serious health condition. Uh, now, those four states to make up for that all have their own statutory disability insurance programs that do cover those types of absences. By comparison, the other laws listed on this slide, Washington State through Colorado, all do cover not just bonding, not just family member serious health, but also the employee's own serious health condition, uh, as well as some other absences. And those laws we refer to as paid family medical leave laws. Um, the three laws at the end, uh, Connecticut, Oregon, Colorado, are not yet currently providing benefits to, uh, to eligible employees. Connecticut benefits will become available beginning at the start of 2022. Oregon follows in 2023, and then Colorado in 2024, as the landscape is currently set up. Um, Hawaii, just as an honorable mention, Hawaii does have a temporary disability insurance law, but not a paid family leave law, so it's not mentioned here. Um, Finally, just a thought on paid sick leave versus paid family leave as we continue to, to walk you through these federal nuances and different proposals. There are, there are certainly related points between the two concepts, but also some distinctions. Paid sick leave is shorter term absences, you know, measured really in days, whereas paid family leave is measured in terms of weeks and months. Uh, paid sick leave is usually for shorter term, less serious absences, you know, routine illnesses, injuries, health conditions, preventative care whereas paid family leave is usually the longer term absences, serious health condition related needs, bonding with a new child and so forth. Uh, paid sick leave is also usually administered between the company and the worker, whereas paid family leave has an insurance angle, you know, usually dealing with the state that administers the program, maybe an insurance carrier, third party administrator, there are payroll deductions in, in, under some laws, uh, pay, pay that has to be remitted to the state or the insurance carrier, so th those are some of the unique distinctions between these two sets of laws, just to keep in mind as we walk through some of the next sections. Next slide, please. So with that, we are actually gonna take a quick look at one of the existing paid sick leave laws, and that is the federal contractor paid sick leave mandate. Uh, next slide, please. As you'll see, so this is the federal contractor paid sick leave law under executive order 13706. It's an Obama era executive order. Uh, you can see the timeline of events that led to it going into effect um, on this slide. It went into effect back on January 1st of 2017, um, providing uh, a leave mandate that applies to all qualifying new and replacement contracts that are entered into, um, whether or not through solicitation on or after January 1 of 2017. Next slide, please. A couple of thoughts about covered contracts under this uh, executive order mandate to the extent you're not all that familiar with it. So number one, it does not apply to all federal contracts. It has to be the right type of contract. Number two, 
it applies to both prime and subcontracts if they fall into the right category. Number three, in addition to being in one of these four categories, the contract also needs to call for the, the wages of the employees that are covered by that contract need to be governed by either the Davis-Bacon Act, the Service Contract Act, or the Fair Labor Standards Act, one of those three. Uh, in terms of the type of contract, again, you can see right on this slide, procurement contracts for construction under the Davis-Bacon Act, service contracts under the Service Contract Act, concession contracts, as well as contracts in connection with federal property or lands that are related to offering services for federal employees, their dependents, or the general public. Those are, are our four types of contracts. <clears throat> now, if you are, again, not all that familiar with this, this law, but do have federal contracts, uh, taking a look at the contract language, right, you know, references to certain FAR clauses, that, that will be the best indicator of whether that contract or subcontract is covered. Next slide, please. In terms of eligible employees, <clears throat> you can see uh, on this slide that it is a, a fairly you know, unique term, right? It doesn't really depend on hours work, doesn't depend on being in a certain uh, type of industry. It, it, it is more focused on whether the employee performs work on or in connection with that covered contract. And those two terms mean something. Working on the contract means that the worker is directly performing the specific services called for by the contract. Working in connection with the contract means that what they're doing is necessary to the performance of the contract, but not necessarily called for expressly under the terms of that contract. <clears throat> there are a couple of exemptions uh, that were built in uh, to, to the eligibility standards. One exists for employees that are performing work in connection with the contract if they spend less than 20% of their work week working on those contract-related matters. Um, Tough administrative burden, though, to, to keep tabs on, on that percentage of work from a week-to-week -week basis. Uh, there was also a CBA exemption uh, for agreements that were entered into uh, prior to September 30th of 2016, and if they were entered into prior to that date, um, the, uh, the employer was able to essentially uh, avoid compliance with, the, with this law as long as it provided um, the right amount of, of paid leave, um, and that, that, uh, that sort of exemption existed from uh, either until the CBA expired or through January 1st of 2020. So that sunset ran for about three years. Um, or excuse me, that, that exemption ran for about three years but had since sunset. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So now we get into some of the details. Uh, once we figure out if you have a covered contract, if you have eligible workers, you'll see these paid sick leave numbers. Uh, rate of accrual, one hour of sick leave for every 30 hours worked on or in connection with the covered contract. Um, employers can front load the paid sick leave at the start of each year. That is permitted in lieu of accrual, but it does not get rid of year-end carryover obligations. So there is no use it or lose it under this federal contract or paid sick leave mandate. Uh, there are two accrual caps that run in tandem and need to be thought of together. Those are a 56-hour annual accrual cap so the worker can earn up to 56 hours per year at that one for 30 rate. There's also a 56 hour point in time accrual cap, which means that the employee's balance can never go above 56 hours. If it hits that mark, accrual freezes until they use some time and then it falls below that balance uh, and they will resume accrual until they either hit the annual cap or that 56 hour maximum balance cap. Uh, there is no cap on annual use of pay sick leave under this law. So an employee, in theory, could roll over 56 hours at year end, use all of that time, and then accrue another 56 hours in that year, and then use those 56 hours as well. So they can use a potential for 112 total hours of paid sick leave in a year. It's quite a, quite a large amount of time compared to especially other state and local uh, sick leave laws in existence. Uh, employers also have a balance notification obligation uh, under three circumstances, including no less than either each pay period or a month, whichever is shorter, depending on the employer's payroll cycles. Um, method of notice, you can provide the notice either via paycheck or through an online system. Next slide, please. A couple more details for you here. Uh, covered reasons for use, fairly run of the mill under sick leave laws, the employee's own illness, injury, health condition, that of a covered family member, as well as preventative care, um, or uh, absences related to uh, domestic violence, sexual assault, or stalking for the employee 
or their, or their covered family member where they are a victim of one of those instances. Um, that we refer to as safe time in the, the paid sick leave space. The federal contractor sick leave mandate has a broad definition of family member. Um, among child, parent, spouse, and domestic partner, as you can see in number three on this slide, it also includes this broad catch-all phrase, any other individual related by blood or affinity whose close association with the employee is equivalent of a family relationship. It's a broad term. It appears in a number of paid sick leave laws. It's also uh, made its way into the paid family leave law space, too. Um, it's a broad term, and, and like, it can rope in neighbors, ex-roommates, friends, maybe even pets. Um, so really a, a lot of, uh, of potential scope there um, and something that we'll see when we get into some of the federal proposals in a few minutes. Next slide, please. A uh, few more procedural details. Uh, you can see employee notice on this slide. Uh, employer, employers can uh, need to allow notice either orally or in writing, seven days advance notice for foreseeable absences, and then otherwise notice as soon as practicable. Employers can require documentation, but only for absences of three or more consecutive full work days, and only if the worker has been notified of that practice, presumably in the, the employer's written policy. Uh, PTO can be used for compliance, but has to satisfy certain conditions, as you can see in that third bullet point. Uh, there will be a no payout obligation upon termination. Uh, that is consistent across all paid sick leave laws, except a little wrinkle in Oakland, California, based on the COVID uh, mandate and its impact on the non-COVID mandate um, in Oakland. And very importantly, there is no preemption of state or local laws under the federal contractor paid sick leave mandate. There is, uh, so what that means is that if you're a multi-state employer, you can go to the next slide for me. If you're a multi-state employer, that means that you have to comply with all applicable laws, both the federal contractor mandate, as well as any applicable state and local laws that might impact the employees working on or in connection with that covered contract. So what does this mean, sort of takeaways from this mandate? Well, a few things. Number one, there is no preemption. Um, that is a theme we will see with some of these, these other proposals we're going to discuss uh, shortly. Um, for employers that, that have to deal with this law, that means you can, and you, and you want to have the requirements run concurrently, you can set up your program to be a one size fits all or one size fits most approach. Um, that is easier said than done because it can result in some big windfalls for workers, but that is in theory one way to go. Um, and also you can see that from a practical uh, challenge hardship on employers, that is not really a defense here. Um, this is a true leave entitlement to employees, and we'll discuss that concept over the next several minutes with other proposals that are out there. Um, and finally, and a very big takeaway when we discuss the federal proposal on page sick leave in a few minutes, Executive Order 13706 really does act as a uh, blueprint for the, the main proposal, the Healthy Families Act that we'll be discussing shortly. So keep a lot of what I just went over in mind as we get to that segment of the discussion. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Stan uh, to take us uh, into our uh, next topic, the Federal Employee Paid Leave Act. Thanks, Josh. Uh, I'm gonna be discussing the Federal Employee Paid Leave Act, we can go to the next slide, as well as the uh, Families First Coronavirus Response Act, uh, which many of you I'm sure are familiar with over the last year or so. And these represent the two congressional actions to uh, put something in the paid leave uh, landscape. So it's sort of a baseline of what Congress has enacted as we look ahead to the proposed legislation that's currently um, been introduced and that is in the works that we'll be discussing in the second half of the webinar today. Uh, so to start off, uh, for federal employees um, in October of 2020, uh, they were given a new paid leave entitlement. It's a limited paid leave entitlement, and it's only for uh, paid parental leave available to certain categories of federal civilian employees, not all government employees, but only some of them. I won't get into the details about which ones, but uh, suffice to say, this is a pretty limited uh, entitlement to only certain individuals. It's limited in, this, in the sense of what it covers. It only covers paid parental leave for a qualifying birth or adoption or a placement of a child in a home. So it does not cover one's own serious health condition or care for a family member due to a serious health condition or a military exigency. Um, interestingly, the Federal Employee Paid Leave Act um, is, is set to harmonize with the FMLA in several respects, the existing unpaid Family Medical Leave Act. 
Uh, most notably, the um, federal employee paid leave is only available if the employee meets the unpaid FMLA eligibility requirements, that is 12 months work and 1,250 hours in the past 12 months. Interestingly, uh, there's also a catch for the employee. The employee just does not get to take the leave uh, scot-free and then walk away from their job. If they do, they have to pay back the health insurance premiums that the government has afforded to them on their behalf. We can go to the next slide. Uh, so it does incentivize employees to come back to work after taking the leave. Uh, you'll, you'll see as we go on today, that's noticeably absent from the, the paid leave proposals that are uh, sought to be imp potentially imposed in the private sector. Um, what this teaches us, you know, though, as we look ahead, is that unpaid FMLA leave will probably live on, either by supplementing whatever paid leave entitlement comes down the road, or as the framework for and, and harmonizing with that entitlement. So you can potentially think of there's a bucket of 12 weeks of leave and some of it might be paid and some of it might be unpaid. Or that unpaid 12 weeks is still out there for certain reasons and potentially there's paid reasons that overlap like a Venn diagram, maybe even expanding the entitlement into new areas as we'll see. And, you know, as we see here too, with this federal paid leave, that's currently on the books. It's only for a very limited purpose. Um, and I think that does underscore the high political hurdle it will take even in the current environment to enact any sort of federal paid leave mandate. Um, there is pending legislation to expand this federal employee paid leave to all the FMLA covered reasons. And that law is facing some of the same challenges. I, I believe that we'll see with the private sector proposals that we'll discuss later on. We can go to the next slide. Uh, and so, as many of you uh, may know, um, Congress enacted a, a limited paid leave entitlement in the private sector due to the coronavirus. We can go to the next slide, um, which uh, the mandate for which sunset at the end of last year. There have been subsequent extensions of the corresponding tax credit so that employers uh, that are that have 500 or, or sorry have fewer than 500 employees. Uh, can still take advantage of those tax credits as they elect to provide leave to their employees or as state and local mandates that don't have corresponding reimbursement obligations require those employers to continue providing uh, paid leave for coronavirus related reasons. And so the FFCRA in its form today is um, a tax credit um, reimbursement essentially, uh, and it covers the employees uh, need for COVID-19 related leave for their own exposure and also to care for a family member and also to care for a child whose school or caregiver is unavailable due to COVID-19. We can go to the next slide. The most recent legislative activity in this area is the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, which extended the FFCRA tax credits through September 30th of this year. It also reset the 80 hour paid sick leave entitlement and expanded the qualifying reasons for leave to include vaccinations and recovering from the vaccine. Interestingly, it also expanded the family leave of up to 12 weeks, paid family leave up to 12 weeks uh, for all of the paid sick leave reasons. Previously, as you may recall, the paid family leave was only limited to care for a child due to school related closure or a caregiver being unavailable. But now it will cover an employee's own health conditions relating to COVID that go beyond the paid sick leave entitlement, things like long COVID or long form exposure to COVID-19. It also raised the, the tax credit uh, that's available to employers. Um, so on the next slide, um, you know, one of the questions that, that we're often asked is, you know, what does it look like? Is the FFCRA going to be extended yet again, the tax credit under it? You know, and that's that's going to depend upon several things, you know, the, the state of the political climate, of course, and the, in the public health um, climate as well. What what does uh, COVID-19 look like uh, next month, the following month? You know, we've been trending in a good direction, but that also, you know, the, the sort of inverse, the COVID-19 situation getting better makes it harder for, I think, any sort of leave proposals to pass. So it's sort of a delicate balance here. And and it really is going to depend upon the political winds at any given time as to what we're about to talk about, uh, how likely it is to uh, pass Congress and be signed by the president. But I think we, we can say that, you know, the, the momentum for this issue is being kept alive, at least in part by the existing FFCRA tax credit. And so with that, I'll turn it back over 
to Josh to uh, touch on some of the federal paid sick leave proposals. Great, great. Thank you, Stan. Um, so the moment that you all have been waiting for, uh, as Stan said, we'll be going into proposed legislation, both on paid sick leave and paid family leave, getting us started with paid sick leave and the Healthy Families Act. You go to the next slide, please. Uh, the Healthy Families Act uh, was, was, has been introduced a few times uh, already in Congress uh, in 2019. Uh, you can see uh, the, the numbers of the bills, both in the Senate and the House there for you. Um, it was reintroduced earlier this year as S-1195 and H.R. 2465 um, in the Senate and House, respectively, both in, in mid-April. Um, all co-sponsors were, uh, were from the Democratic side of the aisle. Um, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, there are a good number of overlaps between this Healthy Families Act proposal and the federal contractor paid sick leave mandate that is on the books. Um, for example, right, the amount of overall time uh, that employees can earn under this proposal, 56 hours of sick leave. If the employer has 15 or more employees, it would be 56 hours of paid job protected sick leave. If they had fewer than 15 employees, it would be 56 hours of unpaid job protected sick leave. Uh, next slide. The Healthy Families Act, um, it, it has, again, a, a number of unique components to it, but also a lot that will look familiar to the federal contractor paid sick leave law. Um, many of these reasons for use should look familiar because we just saw them you know, about 10 slides ago. Uh, covered absences, number one, the employee's own serious health, excuse me, the employee's own physical or mental illness, injury, or medical condition, um, or their need for diagnosis or care or preventative care, uh, caring for a covered family member who has an injury, illness, health condition, or need of preventative care, um, and then a couple of add-ons, right? Th those, those first few reasons I just listed are all also under the federal contract or sick leave mandate. Uh, B and C are some unique wrinkles here under number three. Um, in the case of a child, if the employee needs to be absent to attend a meeting at their child's school or place of care related to the child's health condition or disability, probably covered under federal contractor uh, sick leave as well, but still called out expressly here. Um, and then this, this sort of broad, undefined, caring for a family member who is otherwise in need of care term. Um, pretty, pretty, you know, broad, uh, broad scope um, to potentially go beyond, uh, you know, what we think of in terms of sick leave related absences. Number four is that same safe time related absence for victim status on dealing with domestic violence, sexual assault, or, or stalking. Covered family member um, has virtually the same definition as under the federal contractor paid sick leave mandate. Uh, child, parent, spouse, domestic partner, and again, that, that, that. Uh, frustrating catch-all, any other individual related by blood or affinity whose close association with the employee is equivalent to a family relationship. Uh, I mentioned the potential uh, breadth of that, that phrase and that term um, a few minutes ago, but again, it can go well beyond what we think of in terms of immediate family as well as even extended family. It can go sort of beyond both of those. Uh, domestic partner also has a broad definition. It means uh, another individual with whom the individual is in a committed relationship. Uh, and committed relationship is defined in a way that currently under this proposal doesn't have any financial or cohabitation requirement. Um, so again, that, that term can also lead to some potentially broad uh, coverage for, for the term family member, and in this case, domestic partner. Um, far more expansive than the FMLA's definition of family member. I think that's a, a good takeaway here. Um, and, and you will see that in both a lot of the state paid sick leave laws as well as uh, the, the state paid family leave laws that are popping up. Uh, next slide, please. I saw a question come in, by the way, while we're on this, uh, this slide in terms of some of the procedures under the Healthy Families Act proposal. For purposes of federal contractor paid sick leave, uh, just like under this Healthy Families Act, uh, there is, you know, sort of no express cap on the amount of available sick leave that workers can use per year. So I saw, I saw that question come in just a few minutes ago. So that was with respect to the usage cap. Um, accrual, under the Healthy Families Act, one hour of sick leave for every 30 hours worked with a 56-hour annual accrual cap and a 56-hour appointed time accrual cap, same as the federal contractor paid sick leave setup. And again, federal contractor acting as a, uh, as a barometer, um, as sort of a foundation for this proposal. Um, 
Similar carryover standard, right? Not that carryover is required. There is no express exception in the event the employer front loads uh, paid sick leave. Um, same silence on annual usage tax, as I mentioned just a second ago, uh, which could result in an employee potentially being able to use up to 112 hours of sick leave under this Healthy Families Act proposal uh, per year, depending on, on how the carryover and accrual shakes out. A couple of points of distinction, though, between uh, this proposal and the federal contract of sick leave. Um, while they both say that accrual of sick leave needs to start on day one for new hires, the federal contractor paid sick leave mandate is silent on any permissible usage waiting period um, for new hires, when they get to start using their time. Uh, by comparison, most state and local sick leave laws set it at 90 days um, after hire or, or later. This proposal would set that usage waiting period at just day 60. So that is a shorter uh, window than almost every sick leave law outside of New York and Colorado. Uh, another distinction is in terms of CBAs. You can see on this slide that if a CBA would be, you know, is in effect on the act's effective date, uh, then there would not be a need for that CBA to comply until either the CBA expires or 18 months after the regulations under the act are issued, whichever is earlier. Um, that is cutting down a bit of that grace period window we discussed under the federal contractor uh, sick leave law, where there was a three-year grace period for CBAs in effect uh, before that September 30th, 2016 date under that mandate. Um, the act is also silent on any potential exemptions for CBAs that are entered into after uh, the Healthy Families Act uh, effective date if it were to go into effect. Next slide, please. A couple of other procedures here. Um, some of these will look, again, similar to what we saw in the federal contractor space. Uh, employers can use their existing policies for compliance. Uh, they would be allowed to use, whether it's a sick leave policy, a uh, more general PTO policy. They could both be used and would not have to provide additional paid leave under the Healthy, Fam Healthy Families Act, as long as they satisfy certain conditions, which is kind of boiled down to providing the right amount of leave allowing the employee to use the leave for all the same you know, qualifying reasons and meeting the same conditions of paid sick leave under the Act. And for those of you who have PTO programs or vacation or personal time programs that you're using for state and local sick leave law compliance, this uh, the same conditions concept should sound familiar to you. It, it is broader than just accrual and usage and carryover caps. Those are certainly important, but it also covers all the other substantive technical aspects of these laws increments of use, notice to the company, documentation, treatment of new hires, rates of pay, and, and, and so forth. Um, so again, a, a broad standard there if you do want to use an existing policy for compliance. Uh, employee notice should look identical to the, uh, the standard under the federal contractor mandate. Oral or written notice, seven days for foreseeable absences, as soon as practicable notice otherwise. Uh, there is a distinction uh, between the two in terms of documentation. If you remember the federal contractor slides from a few minutes ago, it was a three or more consecutive full workday standard that the employee had to be absent for in terms of when the employer can require the certification. Under this proposal, the employee uh, would, would only have to turn in documentation if they've been out for more than three consecutive days, right? So that three or more or more than three is a little bit of a wrinkle. Uh, there would also be a notice of posting requirements. Um, in addition to the employer having to notify each employee uh, about their, their rights under the law, the, the, the act also calls for the inclusion in any employee handbook, certain information uh, described um, in the act, including uh, the employee's right to be free from, from retaliation, as well as information about filing an action under the act. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, penalties and prohibitions under the act very common from a paid sick leave law perspective to see prohibitions on discrimination, retaliation, interference, other adverse actions, uh, counting the sick leave under an attendance policy or program and so forth. That's all baked into this Healthy Families Act proposal. Uh, there are a fairly uh, wide range of penalties, uh, back pay, liquidated damages, attorney's fees and interest, uh, Willful violations of notice and posting requirements also result in their own uh, civil fine per offense, uh, and the act would carry a three-year statute of limitations. Uh, it would be enforced by the Secretary of Labor and, and does call for a private right of action. Uh, and on top of all of that, this, this gets even better, on top of all of that, the Department of Labor 
would be permitted under the, the current version of the Healthy Families Act to annually collect data and report out on the availability and use of paid sick time uh, in theory to, to you know, be able to, to propose recommendations uh, on needed updates. Um, and, and for employers to have to think about providing, you know, voluntarily providing information on their sick leave programs to an enforcement agency um, that could then potentially be used against them in terms of an audit, that, that's a piece of this that if the Healthy Families Act moves forward uh, is worth keeping an eye on. Uh, next slide, please. So to round out the Healthy Families Act before we turn uh, to the, the paid family leave proposal landscape, um, you can just get a sense for the likelihood of passage here. Um, for, for starters, and a really important point that's worth noting, um, just like the federal contractor paid sick leave, there is no current preemption under the Healthy Families Act. So even if this act were, were to, to be passed and, and make its way through Congress and get signed by President Biden, it, it would still, as it currently stands, not get rid of that patchwork that we looked at at the beginning of today's presentation. That patchwork would still be there. Um, really important point for employers with multi-state or nationwide operations, uh, effectively saying that the patchwork would just get worse, right? This would be a floor, not a ceiling. Um, now, in terms of what do we think that this could look like if it, if it can make its way through Congress, um, there are some procedural hurdles. You know, budget reconciliation uh, was already used this year with the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, it seems unlikely that the Healthy Families Act that's currently slated would have enough votes, right, the 60 vote count to, to pass uh, to pass through the Senate. Um, that said, and as Stan and Tracy have both mentioned already today, there is momentum, um, you know, currently in the political climate, this is one of those bipartisan issues that you hear being talked about um, where folks on both sides of the aisle do have some appetite for paid leave. Um, the FSCRA and, and you know, the existence of the pandemic has certainly helped push this into more of the, the spotlight. Um, there were hearings just in the last couple of weeks, both in the House and the Senate, on paid leave consideration. So this is something gaining a lot of federal and national attention. Um, that said, whether, what happens with the Healthy Families Act going forward uh, really remains to be seen whether it can be baked into some other larger legislative proposals that are on uh, the President's and the White House's agenda. Um, or if this gets kind of pushed to the side into the coming years and the focus maybe turns to paid family leave. Uh, speaking of paid family leave, I am now going to turn it over to Tracy um, to get us started with the first of three uh, proposed paid family leave legislation. Thank you, Josh. I appreciate it. Next slide, please. So the first one that I want to talk to all of you about is the Family Act. Um, this was reintroduced in February of this year. What this act seeks to do is use new revenue to create a basically a self sustaining fund that would fund new parents, family and military caregivers and individuals with serious health conditions taking up to 3 months of paid leave. Um, and then, of course, this would track with the FMLA current unpaid reasons for use. As you've seen with many of the state paid family leaves, this would be a payroll tax to the employee and the employer to help fund um, this paid leave. Next slide, please. Who would be eligible? Well, it would be somebody who's covered by Social Security, someone who has earned income from employment during the past 12 months, someone who has ultimately filed an, appropriately app an appropriate application for paid family leave benefits and is engaged in qualified caregiving in the 90 days before the application or will ultimately be engaging in qualified caregiving in the 30 days after the application. Notice there are no requirements like you see in the unpaid FMLA about number of employees or tying it to hours of employment or anything of that sort. That's because the eligibility requirements in this proposal would not be tied to employment. Next slide, please. The good news for employers with respect to this particular uh, proposal is that it does track the qualifying reasons for unpaid leave under the current Federal Family and Medical Leave Act. Um, additionally, uh, the Family Act would, though, apply to small employers and new employees at larger employers who previously were not FMLA eligible. 
the FMLA reinstatement rights that all of you are well aware of in the unpaid FMLA context would be in effect um, with respect to paid family leave as well. The one expansion um, with respect to the Family Act proposal is the definition of family member. That is being expanded in the current proposal to include domestic partner in a committed relationship or the son or daughter of a domestic partner. As you all know, uh, neither are included currently in the unpaid FMLA legal framework. Next slide, please. So what would the Family Act do in terms of the paid leave? How will that get calculated? What's the timing? All of those things. So there would be 20 days of paid caregiving leave per month for three months that would be available. This would be up to a total of 60 paid days. The monthly benefit would be calculated using the greater of these two here, a lesser of the 1 18th of the highest annual wages in the last three calendar years or a maximum amount of 4,000 or a minimum benefit benefit amount of 580 per month. This is not an unusual sort of framework. We see a number of states use different caps, tie their caps and or weekly or monthly amounts to different indices and other things. And so um, this is not unusual in that regard, but certainly is the, you know, the federal proposal that ultimately um, you know, could come into effect with respect to paid family leave. The benefits would be reduced by things like workers' comp payments, unemployment, and other payments as defined by the regulations. You know, one of the things is all of you know under the unpaid FMLA is, you know, sort of what is the definition of caregiving, right? Is it taking someone to a doctor's appointment? Is it sitting by someone's side at the hospital? Is it, um, you know, helping someone bathe and feed themselves, right? Um, under the current proposal, uh, caregiving is still unclear in terms of what definition will be applied and how much must be done in order to take pay on a given day. Next slide, please. So what are the procedures um, that will be used to administer this act if passed? One, um, an Office of Paid Family and Medical Leave will be created within the Social Security Administration. And this office will be responsible for administering the benefit, determining entitlements, um, and ultimately, um, you know, administering any benefits. Um, what is very interesting about this is the Family Act does not preempt or supersede state or local laws providing for family and medical leave benefits. So as Josh mentioned in the paid, paid sick leave context, we have the same problem here in the paid family leave context. We're not gonna get any relief from that patchwork of laws that organizations need to currently navigate and ultimately have to uh, try and comply with as they look at their various locations, employees and jurisdictions, et cetera. Um, additionally, the uh, Family Act proposal does say that a CBA or an employer may provide greater benefits if it would like under its own policy. Next slide, please. So what are some of the things to be mindful of in the Family Act proposal in terms of prohibitions to employers? Well, it's unlawful for any person to discharge or discriminate against an individual because the individual has applied for um, has said that they intend to apply for or is receiving benefits. This is very comparable to the interference language in the unpaid FMLA. What are damages or penalties that someone could collect if they um, felt that their paid family leave rights under this proposal were um, uh, infringed upon? Well, they could get back pay, interest, liquidated damages, and attorney's fees. There is a private right of action, including a collective action, which as all of you know, is also a considered a class action for similarly situated individuals. This collective action would proceed under 216B of the Fair Labor Standards Act, not under Rule 23 of the um, how class actions generally proceed. Next slide. Um, so like Josh, you know, I'm looking into my crystal ball thinking about what is the likelihood of this passing. Um, you know, this, the Family Act is part of the budget reconciliation and under the Senate's budget rules, a bill that goes through reconciliation cannot affect Social Security. 
And you're probably all thinking, well, Tracy, didn't you just tell me this is creating an office within the Social Security Administration? Yes, that's exactly what I just said. Um, so, you know, certainly, um, you know, I think the argument that is going to be made is that the Family Act is really sort of creating this insurance trust fund, that it's going to be funded by general treasury funds, and that really Social Security is not being impacted other than in the administration of the benefit. Um, we'll see if that logic um, flies in terms of moving forward with the passage of the Family Act, but otherwise do know that that is a hurdle it has, um, you know, in terms of being able to get passed as a paid family solution, paid family leave solution. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Stan to talk about our uh, next proposed family um, solution. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, we'll be uh, taking a, a short uh, walk uh, away from the Capitol here for a minute down to the White House to hear what President Biden has to say about all of this. Um, as you might recall, about six weeks ago, he gave a speech to the nation and unveiled some uh, some some ideas around that in writing uh, in line with his speech about uh, paid family leave and paid sick leave. And this slide has a few of the, the high level bullet points from President Biden's uh, ideas. Um, he does say he supports a national comprehensive paid family and medical leave program. Uh, the details of which are, 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 are not entirely fleshed out in what he released, but it does appear that he supports something at least as broad and possibly broader than the Family Act. Uh, and what I mean by that is it does include, uh, his, his idea includes wage replacement for not only the FMLA covered reasons for leave, but also for safe time and also three days of annual bereavement leave, which is a concept that we haven't seen in any of the legislative proposals to date. Uh, his, his idea is to roll it out slowly so that over time employees would be entitled to more and more leave, uh, culminating with 12 weeks by the 10th year of a program. Um, he also proposes, like we have marginal income tax rates, we would have marginal leave entitlement payment amounts. So the more someone makes, the more they would get in their leave entitlement payment up to a certain cap. So there would be a floor and a ceiling to how much an employee would receive based on their, their normal uh, rate of pay. And he also endorses the Healthy Families Act for sick leave. And so against that backdrop, literally on um, one day prior, the um, House Ways and Means Chairman Richard Neal uh, released on his website, but has not yet introduced into Congress, uh, his own proposal uh, called the Building an Economy for Families Act. This is a very interesting proposal, in, in my opinion, and it, it's, it's very cleverly crafted, uh, it appears, to uh, maneuver around and, and ideally position it for a simple majority passage in the Senate if there was political support. Uh, and you'll see why as we go through the slides here. Um, the, the overall concept of the Building and Economy for Families Act, which we've started to call BIFA, I guess, for just the acronyms of the, the first letters, uh, is universal paid family and medical leave benefits. And it's funded by the Treasury Department. There's no mention of Social Security or the Social Security Administration at all. Um, it, interestingly, it offers employers a subsidy for offering comparable leave through their own private uh, leave programs that might be in your handbook, your employee handbook, or in your employment policy. Um, and interestingly, also, if you don't cover everything that BIFA says you should cover, you can still get a subsidy if you cover some of what it covers. Uh, it also provides funding to state and local governments for their existing uh, uh, family leave, paid family leave laws through what they call a grandfather clause. What also is interesting about this uh, is that the FMLA reasons for leave are going to be covered, but the eligibility requirements, that is working for an employer for 12 months, having worked for 1,250 hours in the past 12 months, do not apply as this is a universal paid family leave program. And so all workers qualify, self-employed individuals, part-time workers, gig economy workers, anybody that has income that's reported to the treasury is gonna qualify under the BIFA idea. And so it extends to everyone who files an application, 
has one or more caregiving days in a period of time that's just before the application to just after the application um, and has some amount of wages or self-employment income close to the time they want to take leave and then has some amount of earnings on file with the, the federal government essentially. Um, what, that, what also is interesting is that if the employer provides coverage to the employee directly, the employee can't go get the same coverage from the government. So there's no double dipping allowed. We can go to the next slide. So there are the qualifying reasons that track the FMLA qualifying reasons for leave. And like with the other paid family leave proposals that we've talked about today, it does expand the idea of a qualifying family member. Uh, and it defers a lot of the discretion in how broad to define that to regulations, which as, as we've seen from the unpaid FMLA, when that happens, we get all the answers we want and it's crystal clear on how to uh, administer the law from the employer's perspective. Uh, much sarcasm in that statement for sure. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it seems to take the, the approach of the unpaid FMLA and punting some of the, the sort of the day-to-day, -day, how do we do this issues into the, the arms of the uh, regular, the administrative state. Um, and so unlike the Family Act, which Tracy just talked about, um, the, the concept of a caregiving day here is defined actually a little more rigorously to a day where the employee, the individual is engaged in at least eight hours of qualified caregiving or more than four hours for each of two days. And, and I, I like that from, from a perspective of a, a defense lawyer who's helping employers work through leave fraud and abuse and misuse issues all the time. So it seems to cut out the idea that an employee could take leave go check on a family member, provide 15 minutes of caregiving, then go to the beach for the rest of the day and get a full day's worth of pay from the employer or from the government. Here in BFA, there seems to be a, a pretty high threshold that you have to be engaging in caregiving for all day or most of the day for two days uh, if you want to get a day's worth of pay. So, uh, you know, one thing it doesn't cover though, and what would still be a challenge, I believe under any sort of concept like this would be uh, inter inter intermittent taking of leave, which this proposal does embrace, that employees would be allowed to take leave for caregiving reasons or for their own conditions as needed. So you'd still have the same issues that you might be facing today with unpaid FMLA, like employees taking leave in a pattern of Mondays or Fridays or the day after the Super Bowl or the day after Halloween or any other pattern of absences and how you manage through that and what you can and can't do to detect and deter and punish leave abuse and fraud, all those same questions are going to be uh, going to be at hand. And uh, it will be, you know, there's going to be things you can do to be proactive about it. And there's going to be likely a lot of things you can't do, just like in the current unpaid FMLA space when it comes to de detecting and deterring fraud and abuse. So we can go to the next slide. So uh, as I mentioned before, uh, just like with President Biden's uh, ideas about what he would support, the, uh, the paid leave entitlement here is on uh, a sliding scale. So it creates a floor and it creates a ceiling for how much the payments uh, is to the employee for, for the leave period. It also comes in with a five-day waiting period, which is very similar to a short-term disability uh, program that, that you might have or that might, you might typically see in the private sector. Um, so uh, we can go to the next slide. And uh, it also has some of the features that you'd see uh, kind of like in the current unpaid FMLA, where the employee is to provide at least seven days advance notice uh, when that is practicable. Uh, but then of course, if the employee can't do that, the employee is not disqualified from, from getting leave uh, if it's a sudden need for leave. The, the employee has to fill out an application initially that includes a medical certification, but then on a monthly basis thereafter, once approved, they are to fill out just a monthly claim form that specifies what days they took leave for qualifying reasons. And a subsequent medical certification is not required in each month. Um, so the employee is providing this form to the government and the government is processing this with remarkable speed under BFA. I, I you know, would wonder what, um, you know, whether this is actually achievable or not, but to process applications within 15 days, process monthly benefit claims forms within 15 days, and issue payments within 15 days of determination. So it sets a very aspirational standard for how quickly uh, the applications would be processed and how, how quickly the payments would be made to individuals under this program. We can go to the next slide. 
Uh, and so uh, from the employer's perspective, I touched on this a little bit earlier, the, the employer has the opportunity to get reimbursement uh, under BFA for providing uh, paid leave that's equivalent through employment policies or you know, provisions in their handbook. And so, um, you know, it doesn't have, you, as the employer, you don't necessarily have to meet all the criteria of BFA in order to get some amount of reimbursement, but you get a higher percentage uh, if you do meet every single criteria that BFA requires. Um, one thing that um, BFA does do is it, it creates a separate bucket of leave so that an employer can't just take their existing sick leave or PTO program, overlay that directly on top of this new requirement and make the employee run everything concurrently and then seek reimbursement. Rather, there would have to be a separate bucket of leave from which the employee is taking the paid family leave under BFA, and that's what the employer is seeking reimbursement on. And the employee then is preserving whatever other paid time off or sick leave the employer provides under its other policies or that might be required by state or local law. Uh, importantly here, it, just like with the other proposals, there's no preemption. This is just going to lay on top of every, uh, every other requirement that might be imposed by a state or a local law. One of the good uh, concepts here that I think is worth you know, taking note of, and hopefully we'll see this in proposals going forward, is that if the employer provides uh, BFA qualifying family leave through uh, a short-term disability plan or a sickness and accident plan, those can be used uh, to seek reimbursement, just as long as the employee isn't required to double dip and take leave concurrently with other things like sick leave and paid time off. So we can go to the next slide. And then, of course, the employer has to jump through a few hoops to, to get the reimbursement, paying a $50 annual fee uh, as provided in the statute, submitting an annual report, so disclosing essentially how many employees are taking leave and for what amounts, uh, and have its written policy uh, approved by the Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, it, would be, it will be very interesting to see how long that will take. If, if payments are being made in 15 days, I, I, uh, I'm left to wonder how long it would take the government to review and approve all the employer's policies that might be seeking to take advantage of the reimbursement. Uh, and then there is a requirement that the employer's policy has to provide at least 15 days of paid leave and pay at least 50% of each employee's rate of pay, which doesn't exactly line up with the reimbursement amounts that the government would, would provide or that the government would provide to an employee who's applying on their own when their employer doesn't have a program that provides coverage. Uh, interestingly, also, the, the employer must have a non-interference commitment in its policy, uh, which is necessary because BFA does not have a private right of action, and it does not have any prohibitions. There's no requirement that an employer has to provide any of what I've been talking about. It's simply if you do provide it, that you can get some reimbursement. So it's much like the FFCRA in its current state where the employer can get tax credits if they provide the leave, but they're not under any mandate as of uh, 2021 to do so. We go to the next slide. And so you might be wondering, well, gee, why, why didn't they include these, uh, you know, what you typically see, a private right of action, all sorts of penalties on employers for not complying. And it, I suspect the reason for this is to increase the likelihood of getting through the budget reconciliation process. We saw with the American Rescue Plan Act earlier this year uh, that efforts to include things like minimum wage increases, mandates essentially on employers to increase the minimum wage, would not be able to be passed through the budget reconciliation process. The Senate parliamentarian told the Senate to, that if you wanted to put something like that through, you're going to have to get the full 60 votes and vote cloture and debate, uh, and you can't do the reconciliation process. It requires just a simple majority. So by design, there's no employer mandate here. There's nothing that, that's an employer prohibition. And I think that will make it more likely that the Senate will be able to convince the parliamentarian to let them slide this through under uh, a simple majority uh, framework through reconciliation. Uh, you can go to the next slide. I think I, yep. And that's basically what I was just covering right there. Um, uh, what's interesting also about uh, BIFA is it has uh, proposals to permanently extend what we see under the American Rescue Plan Act as far as expanded child care uh, and earned income tax credits. Uh, so it is a very uh, expensive proposal, and I suspect one of the large uh, hangups that the, the Republicans might have to this is the, is the cost. Uh, and so that may be the largest hurdle to something like this, even if there's a political climate to provide some sort of paid leave entitlement, the cost may ultimately be a, a political barrier that, that can't be overcome. 
Um, with that, uh, as we, uh, before we move on, I would like to read the CLE code for today. Uh, you'll want to take this down if you're, you're seeking CLE credit for the program. Uh, the code is SS, as in Seifarth Shaw, the number 8399. So SS8399. And with that, I will turn it over to Josh uh, to talk a little bit about the final proposal uh, that is on the table these days. Great, thanks, Dan, and, and thanks, Tracy. Um, as we mentioned a little while ago, there were these three proposals um, in, in terms of federal paid family leave options that have at least been, been sort of on the table introduced. Um, the the, the oh, Stan, would you be able? I just saw a couple of questions come in um, about the the CLE code. Would you happen to to have that one more time for folks? We'll be sure, sure to, sure to thing. get that yes. code off. Sorry about that. Oh, great. If, let me find it again. I did I did not have that memorized. I had to write that down myself. <laughs> <laughs> yes, SS is in Cyphorth Shaw, eight three. Nine nine. Great, great. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> all right. Um, so, so that is uh, the, the all important, maybe the, the most important part of everything we said today, the, the CLE code. Um, so, so turning back to, to our final of the three uh, proposals, uh, the, the, there is a third, uh, third option on the table. Uh, the newest of the three that was just uh, introduced, as you can see on this slide, within the last couple of weeks, it was back on May 27th, uh, introduced by House Ways and Means Republicans. Um, the entirety of the package, which they're calling the Protecting Worker Paychecks and Family Choice Act, um, has not yet made its way to the House floor, although it has over a dozen different components all sort of aimed at addressing concepts within the paid family leave scope and world. Um, and a few of them, and, and, and the, more, the one that is most notable from my perspective, um, has been already been introduced earlier this year. And we'll, we'll touch upon that in just in a minute or so. Um, this is a competing proposal uh, to the Democratic paid leave legislation that, uh, that Tracy and Stan uh, just spoke about, the Family Act and the Building an Economy for Families Act. Um, that said, and, and something that is worth noting right, right from the get-go here, is that the Protecting Worker Paychecks and Family Choice Act does not impose a, a true paid leave mandate uh, that is not included in the proposal. You know, and it, it reminds me of, of some similar uh, Republican proposals that were introduced a couple of years ago. Uh, in 2019, there was this New Parents Act, if you remember maybe seeing some, some articles and news coverage about deferring social security payments and, and using those, uh, those benefits ahead of time for certain bonding related leaves. Um, that was the New Parents Act, again, not a, a leave entitlement, but more of a rejiggering of social security. And then the separate Advancing Support for Working Families Act that would have allowed sort of an advancement of the child tax credit um, after birth or adoption to help uh, give new parents a little bit of extra uh, money in their pockets to help with some of their, their caregiving costs. Um, so, so that is, you know, that, you know, this is sort of similar, this Protecting Worker Paychecks and Family Choice Act has some creative components, um, but again, not a, a true leave entitlement like the Family Act or the Healthy Families Act of the Sick Leave World that we've spoken about earlier. Next slide, please. So we will not be hitting upon all the different sections uh, within this proposal, but we'll give you a couple of the highlights. Uh, so section 101, uh, it talks about modifying the employer tax credit for paid family medical leave. Um, uh, essentially, the, that tax credit, which was created by the Tax Cuts uh, and Jobs Act, um, would, is currently slated to expire at the end of 2025. This, this proposal would make that tax credit permanent. Uh, in addition, um, it would set up uh, essentially a phase out process where employers that are newly offering paid family medical leave plans would receive uh, the, the tax credit, you know, first at, at sort of a full credit and then at, at decreased percentages until a final after the fifth year phase out. Um, employers who are currently claiming the credit would be grandfathered in to the full credit through 2025 and then the phase out would start in 2026 under this part of the proposal. Uh, section 102 is referred to as the family savings account uh, component of, of this proposal. Um, 
as you can see here, it would create sort of this new uh, tax advantage account designed to be a flexible savings vehicle for families for a whole bunch of different, different components, including for wage replacement during periods of parental or medical leave. Um, child care, elder care, school expenses would also be baked into that. Um, it would uh, allow partici our participants to contribute up to $5,000 per year with the contributions rolling over uh, year after year, and employers would also be able to contribute uh, to the account to support their employees as well. Um, in addition, a couple of honorable mentions, there's other parts of the proposal that would expand a small employer pooling options for paid family medical leave, and then also uh, sort of amend the child care entitlement to states, the CCES, um, to help promote equitable access to paid family leave uh, for low-income parents. That's another part of the proposal. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the part that is most interesting to me of, of this Protecting Worker Paychecks and Family Choice Act um, is uh, H.R. Uh, 1980. It was, it's called the Working Families Flexibility Act, introduced back in mid-March of this year. Uh, it would amend the FLSA to give private sector employees the option, right, in, instead of taking uh, overtime wages, right, receiving cash for their overtime wages, as, as is currently the setup, they would instead select to receive compensatory time off. Um, this would have to be set up through, again, a voluntary agreement with the employer. That agreement would have to be in writing or some other verifiable record. Um, but it is a, a unique uh, component, you know, a unique proposal. Um, that has some, some, some really interesting uh, details. So, for example, uh, the amount of time, right, this compensatory time off would accrue uh, at a rate of one and a half hours of compensatory time off for each hour of overtime compensation uh, that the employee would be entitled to, up to 160 hours. Now, it's not clear if that's 160 hours per year, which is mentioned in some of the, the materials that have been released since this proposal first came out a few weeks ago, but if you look at the actual uh, the, the text of the legislation that they've introduced or the, the lengthy you know, few dozen pages text, that per year for the 160 hours is not there. So it's not clear if this would just be on a rolling basis. Uh, eligibility, an employee would have to work at least 1,000 hours in a period of continuous employment with the employer during the preceding 12-month period, uh, and then also have that sufficient agreement with the employer. On the next slide, you'll see another really fascinating part of this proposal, which involves cash out. There would be a mandatory year-end cash-outs for employers where they would have to compensate workers for the unused uh, compensatory time off um, no later than January 31st uh, of that year for any earned unused time for the prior year. There would be mid-year cash-out options for employees as well. Um, if the employee were to, uh, to request in writing that they have received monetary compensation instead of keeping the earned unused compensatory time, the employer would have to give the cash out within 30 days. Uh, the employer also could cash down the employee's uh, balance of compensatory time if they have an amount over 80 hours. They could cash it down after giving the worker 30, uh, 30 days worth of notice, so cash down anything above 80 to the 80-hour mark. And then cash out upon separation would be required as well. Uh, both workers and employers have the option of discontinuing the setup with a certain amount of notice being provided. Uh, and the use of the time, there is no uh, set reasons for use under the proposal. Um, the compensatory time off, the worker could use it, assuming they have it accrued and it's unused, request it from the company. The company would then have to give the worker that time off within a reasonable period after the request, as long as the request does not unduly disrupt the operations of the employer. Um, really interesting proposal, silent on preemption of state or local laws. Um, so keep, keep again, uh, you know, focus on this, uh, this sort of piece uh, family uh, Working Families Flexibility Act coming through this Republican proposal. Next slide, please. Uh, finally, one, one last piece here. Uh, again, this would be an amendment to uh, the Internal Revenue Code and it's set up for dependent care flexible spending accounts. Among other highlights, tripling the limit for dependent care FSAs to $15,000. Um, overall, the Protecting Worker Paychecks and Family Choice Act I think it, as it stands, has a low likelihood of passage given the political climate and makeup of Congress, um, lack of an actual paid leave mandate. But some components do have interesting pieces to them. So again, pay attention to it. It's very new, still in the very early drafting stages. But let's see where this goes in the next you know, few weeks and months. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, finally, uh, for those of you um, who are struggling with the paid leave patchwork, I've seen a few comments come in about 
expiration dates of COVID-19 sick leave laws, the other scope of, of, of sick leave evolution. We have some great resources available, comprehensive surveys, uh, mailing lists with our legal updates and blog posts. You can sign up for the mailing list through that link. It takes you about a minute. You can also uh, email paidleave at sidebark.com for more information on our surveys as well. Uh, with that, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you to, to Tracy and Stan. Um, again, we hope you found this, uh, this helpful uh, and informative. Pay attention to federal paid leave. As we've been saying, there is a ton of momentum uh, based on the pandemic for this type of mandate in the coming weeks and months. Thank you again, everyone. We really appreciate it. Thank you for attending. This now concludes today's webinar. Have a great afternoon. All right.